Welcome everyone to the Day After Tomorrow webinar series. This is our fourth installment and our topic today is Managing by Freedom within the framework post-COVID-19. These webinar series are an extensive effort by the ECLIF Executive Education Center of Asia School of Business. My name is Hadija and I am very honored to be moderating the session today. Before I introduce our esteemed speakers, may I please intrigue your curiosity about freedom, especially in the context of social distancing in the time of COVID-19. Among the questions that we would like to discuss and hopefully answer today are, can freedom be found in a lockdown? And what are permanent changes COVID-19 bring, uh, bringing in terms of the way we work and interact with one another? Um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to post your questions in the Q&A slot. You are welcome to upvote the questions posted by other attendees by clicking the thumbs up uh, button. Additionally, you may also specifically address your questions to either of the speakers or the questions can be general. Thank you. May I now please welcome our speakers. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Tan Tamrong Nawasawad and Mr. Monty Sujanani. Dr. Tan is a professor of practice from the ECLIF Executive Education Center at Asia School of Business. He specializes in breaking complex uh, management and uh, business model into easy, implementable steps for organizations across industries. Um, welcome, Dr. Tan. Hello, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, glad to be here today. <laughs> And we have Mr. Monty Sujanani, who is the director of Robert Walters to Philippines. Uh, Mr. Monty joined Robert Walters Beijing in 2013 in technology recruitment for two years. He spent four years in Robert Walters Singapore, heading up their technology contracting division before moving to head up uh, Philippines. Welcome, Mr. Monty. Thank you very much, Dr. Hadija. Thank you. Mr. Monty, out of curiosity, how is the COVID situation in the Philippines right now? Wow, that's a big question. Um, so, so the Philippines, we went on lockdown um, quite a while ago, actually. We're, we're, next week, we're going into our seventh week. So 16th of March, uh, they declared the, um, we declared the entire Luzon area, which happens to be the biggest island in the Philippines, um, home to about 56 million people, uh, are on total lockdown. Um, now, you know, this, it's, been, it's been quite a challenging time. Um, most businesses are working from home uh, or, or running on very, very minimal uh, workforce. Um, we are still seeing cases. I think, as if I'm not wrong, it's, I think it's about 6,500, about 6,700 cases, and that's climbing. Um, and today is a big day. Uh, the, the president is due to announce um, whether or not the lockdown is going to be extended. So um, everyone sort of sitting at the edge of the seats wondering what's going to happen because uh, it, had, it was extended once and um, there's, they're not really, we're not quite sure whether it's still going to be extended. So everyone's just um, waiting to see what happens. Thank you, Mr. Mati. We're hoping for the best. Uh, the same situation as well in Malaysia. We are waiting for the next announcement and we are also split on either spectrum, but hoping for the very best for both countries and for the world, of course. Um, Dr. Tan, one of the very visible change due to the COVID-19 is the unprecedented and inevitable degree of freedom for employees. Um, can you briefly explain the concept of managing by freedom within the framework? Yes, uh, of course. Um, um, yes, thank you, Dr. Hadija. And hello again, everybody. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. And I'm very glad to see that you have chosen to be with us today. Well, I mean, freedom is a, is a big topic, right? So let me scope it down and just focus this on around um, managing people in particular, right? That are very pertinent for managers and leaders in organizations uh, today amidst uh, the COVID-19 situation. So I mean, to keep it simple, uh, I've actually prepared a slide. Uh, so if, if uh, Dr. Hadija, you could put, yeah, okay. Thank you for that, right? So I mean, to keep it simple, really when we're talking about managing by freedom within the framework, it's we're talking about, again, managers and leaders that are, who are trying to balance right, the, essentially this fulcrum, which is between giving too much freedom versus having the employees feeling that they are not given enough uh, trust, right? And it, you know, as simple as it looks, it's, it's a struggle to, to try to man, maintain this balance. Uh, especially now when most of us are working away from the office, uh, out of sight, and uh, you know, essentially working from home. 
Uh, well, it's just to keep it simple for now, right? I think the key that you see in the slides that the key lies in in values and purpose, okay? or, or rather the alignment uh, of our values and purpose versus uh, those who we work with. You know, be it our, uh, our, our subordinate, our peers, uh, our bosses, or even our clients. Right? Um, and it's, it's about looking at ourselves and, uh, and looking at these, uh, the people whom we work with through this lens. And it's, it's by understanding how our values and purpose align that allows us to at least begin to, to work with them or, or, or to manage the freedom. And, and I'll come back and expand on this a little bit later on in, in today's session. But for the, for the moment, it's just a matter of uh, balancing this and looking through the lens of values and purpose. Yeah. Now, but to, to clarify quickly when I use those two terms, uh, you know, values are uh, the principles that, that give our lives meaning, and it allows us to persevere through adversity. And uh, purpose are the goals that we, we chose to live out uh, our values, so to speak. Right? Or in Eclipse term, uh, uh, we have used this for, for quite a while now, and in, in, uh, in Eclipse terms, values are the engine that drives leaders, and purpose is sort of the destination of that drive. Okay. And when we're talking about values, we're talking about things like uh, achievement, discipline, um, security, belonging, compassion, wealth, right? Or I mean, it could even be enjoyment. I mean, some people, uh, you know, having an enjoyment is, is a very, very important thing for them. So it's very unique and it's important depending on the individuals. And we believe that by understanding these uh, values and purpose of the individuals is is the key to unlock uh, balancing that freedom versus uh, the feeling of mistrust. Thank you, Dr. Tan, that was very interesting. Uh, I really like the part where you say that um, you reminded us that values are the principles that give meanings to our life. So uh, basically the values of our companies are also uh, the ones that give meaning to the daily tasks, daily duties that we do. Um, that was very insightful, thank you. Um, if I may shift the attention to Mr. Monty, we wonder now how much freedom is enough freedom and how much is too much? Um, with that, Mr. Monty, would you mind sharing what is your view on the idea of giving employees more freedom as well as what are some of the best practices or experiences at Robert Walters? Uh, sure, Dr. Harija. Well, actually, um, and Dr. Tan, that was really insightful uh, and it's going to link to how Parts of it is going to link to, I think, a couple of things that we've done. Um, but to answer your question, Dr. Hadija, I, absolutely, I think it is essential. Firstly, I think it's essential to give employees freedom. I mean, regardless of, you know, whether we're working from home um, or in the office, I think it's essential uh, that, you know, there is that sense of autonomy and trust. Uh, trust is a big word. And, um, you know, and I think that's probably, you know, the, the, the key here uh, when it comes to freedom. It's just so it just so happens that now I, you know we have to give more freedom, right? Given the the circumstances and the working arrangements. Um, but to me, I think, and and this ties into what uh, uh, Dr. Tan's just mentioned. Um, but it also, I believe, it starts with the culture you foster. Um, so so from that, we talk about values and purpose. Uh, we ran an exercise uh, at Robert Walters where we got each and every one to write down what is important to them. So this did not come from, from head office, didn't come from me, didn't come from my leadership team. This came from every single person um, and the core values that they live by. Uh, now, of course, we had a box full of different values, but interestingly, we seven core values came out of this exercise. And this is something we then broadcasted to the office. Um, you know, These are the seven values that collectively as a team, as a group, is what we feel very strongly by. And, I, and, and that was, that created the boundary of our DNA and of our culture. Uh, and I think it made it a lot easier once we, we knew all of that. Um, and I, I mean, to be honest, this is, you know, the culture and the DNA for us is probably the biggest attribute of our business. Um, this created allowance for autonomy. I mean, it starts from day one. Uh, we were able to build a high trust environment we have a very hard work ethic. I think there was commitment and loyalty. To be honest, I think we're freaks. You know, we love what we do. Um, and, you know, we established this by asking and knowing the why. And, uh, you know, there's so much about, you know, how we do what we do and what we do, but really why we're doing this. And, and that ties up with purpose. And actually, interestingly for us, knowing all of this, 
has given us the freedom to give freedom. Um, and, you know, it, it, a combination of all of, of, of understanding the values and purpose. And now it goes, so this is just more on the intangibles, right? That, that we are, are talking about in terms of culture and we talk about the values and purpose. Um, and what we've done is, you know, we, we've now obviously uh, taken all of this into consideration and approached management styles and leadership styles uh, that are a little bit more flexible, a bit more autonomous. Um, it, it's more outcome-based. So for example, uh, we, we agree to a specific outcome. Now, how or when is it's up to the employee to achieve those outcomes? Um, it's at the discretion of the employee. So we call this discretionary effort, right? Um, and as long as it's clear, so the communication on the expectations are clear and it's agreed on and, you know, teams, uh, are, are, they, they go off and they, and they do what they need to do. Um, now, of course, you know, when we're looking at outcomes and we talk about specific outcomes, we have to be very aware of working environments um, and surroundings. So, again, the people that you're leading and you're managing, they, they might be the same people physically, but actually you're now running a completely different team when they're working at home. But there's so many external factors that you have to keep in, uh, in check, like, you know, kids at home or, you know, just conducive working environments. So being aware of all of this, I think, is very critical before you actually embark on, on you know, identifying how much freedom you, you can give, because you have to be aware. Um, but again, at the, at the end of the day, what, you know, we, we've taken all of this into consideration. Um, and and we, we have our teams, um, you know, again, we, we have to trust them, and then they go off and they achieve uh, their outcomes. Now, that's then the intangible, that I, before I just end that question, um, I think tangibles are also quite important when we're giving people freedom. We've got to have the right setup and the right infrastructure um, for them to be successful. Uh, so, you know, things like uh, uh, technology setup and technology has played a big part in this, um, collaboration tools, uh, and, and just coming up with, with clear frameworks on, you know, having access to you when they need it, um, and just coming up with a clear check-in check schedule uh, just so that they know you're there for them. Um, so you're giving them freedom, but hey, that's okay. I'm here if you need me, whenever you need me. So yeah, that's a very long answer to your question of how we do things in Rubber Walters. Uh, thank you for sharing, Mr. Wong. I really like the part that you mentioned that um, as long as we're working together to a specific outcome, and then also it's not like blindly, um, the ends here do not actually justify the means because the means actually you got the values together. You ask people to to come up with values, and then you find things which are actually actually overlapping the seven values, at least seven of them. So um, that was also very very um, insightful and enriching. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tan, uh, this goes without saying, but the managing by freedom uh, framework is definitely very intriguing. Uh, we wonder now, how is this different from managing people as usual per, before COVID-19? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm actually, I'm intrigued by what Monty has shared about uh, the practice at Robert Walters, because, um, you know, personally, I, I do not know or have heard of many organizations who would ask individuals about their own values and purpose, right? I think a lot of organizations that I've worked with kind of make the assumption that because you chose to work here, you hear our values, right? And hear our purpose. And it may be true in some cases, but it might not be true in all cases. And uh, I'm just very glad to hear, Monty, you share that at Robert Walters, you start at the individual level and you work up for collective um, set of shared values and purpose, okay? Um, but uh, to, to answer your question, I think, I think um, it is different from how we used to manage people before, but, but I wouldn't say that it's specific to just because of COVID-19 either, right? Like what we just heard Monty mention, Robert Walter did not just begin to do this, right? To have freedom to manage by freedom because of COVID-19. Yes, I mean, COVID-19 kind of brought this, kind of accelerated and catalyzed this right? because uh, um, now we are so far away from each other and, um, and the issue about trust and interesting, the word micromanagement. Okay? Personally, I thought that this word has kind of become extinct because everybody knows that we should not micromanage our people. Right. Yet during COVID time, that word is making a comeback and you're hearing feedback from employees now that uh, they're being managed uh, in, a, in a micro kind of way. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the 
the, the trending, right? You know, the trending towards working with employees and giving them more freedom is already there. And uh, at Eclipse, we have written uh, a book, right? the book called Open Source Leadership, uh, written by Rajiv Pachavria in 2017, talks specifically about this trend, about moving towards freedom when it comes to managing people. And uh, there are examples uh, in the book cited, you know, Netflix, uh, General Electric, uh, even General Motors, which is a car manufacturer. So they are also moving towards uh, giving employees more more freedom by Mary Barra, the CEO. And I also, I think I have so one uh, example of uh, one Miras in Malaysia. So Dr. Hadija, you advance the slide once, right? You see, yeah, here we go, right? So this is one organization that's very close to us, right? This is our, our very own uh, Employee Provident Fund or EPF, right? Which is, in this case, they had won the uh, Talent Corp Life at Work Awards in 2018. Or essentially, this is a full flexibility for employees to choose when they want to work. And uh, as uh, uh, Tunku Zakri said here, that as long as you know, we, we manage towards the outcome. So as long as the outcome is there, we're willing to have the brevity and the trust to evolve around uh, our workplace practice around it. So my my job is a bit <laughs> it's a bit is a bit of a challenge because you know, I think at the uh, you see the trend if you look at the CEO level, right, or even at the country director's level that you hear from Monty, right, the, con the conceptual of managing people by freedom is there, right, especially, um, uh, Dr. Hitch, have you click the slide once more, right, yes, yeah, so this is what kind of what an employer, uh, sorry, one more back, uh, back once, I just want to show the background here, right, so when we're talking about COVID-19, this is essentially the backdrop that we're talking about managing people by freedom, it's because nobody is around for you to manage, manage them by no freedom anymore, right? And uh, so, so my job is, the, the challenge of my job is how do, you, how do you make this more practical, right? Applicable, or at least something that is visual that, that organizations can begin uh, to work towards it and begin to move from conceptual into something that's uh, in practice, so to speak, okay? So um, let me, let me uh, okay, now can I have the, 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 the picture? Okay. Right, so uh, excuse me, it's gonna look a little bit theoretical here, but I think this is a, it's just a ni nice backdrop that we could use in order to bring that concept into, into reality, okay? So, um, <clears throat> well, you can see the picture here, it, it describes the uh, six zones of managing people by freedom within the framework. Okay, now we don't have a lot of time here today, so I'm just gonna give you the general idea uh, it, it plots the degree of freedom that you see here on the uh, on the vertical on the y axis here, and it's a function of alignment of values and purpose, right, between you and your people. So as you move up from the bottom left corner, right, so you see the green zone there from the bottom left corner, right, when you increase the alignment, you're gonna have a proportional increase in the freedom and trust. Yeah, so that green zone is moving diagonally across from bottom left to top right. And in this screen, it's denoted in zone one, two, and three, which corresponds to a low degree of uh, alignment. Therefore, you have a low degree of freedom. And then when you go to moderate and you go to full degree of alignment and full degree of freedom in zone three. Yeah. What's interesting here is we also have um, sort of the out of sync or the unaligned zones. Okay, namely, you see here it's uh, zone four and zone five. Okay, so let's say zone four where James sit here just for the sake of having somebody in there, right? Uh, these are employees who are essentially causing headaches, right? Because they're making uh, decisions that are <laughs> kind of uh, are perplexing their managers. Okay, and um, that's that would be that would happen when you're giving too much freedom with somebody who doesn't align to the organization's values and purpose. Right? And conversely, on the other end of the spectrum, you will have somebody like Lisa in zone five, right? who might be feeling mistrusted because uh, she, at least she feels that she has a good alignment with the organization's values and purpose, yet she is being treated uh, you know, that with, with a way that either resembles micromanagement or to her, it's a mistrustment uh, by the boss and the organization. Okay? Uh, now this can span anywhere from a person-to-person -person treatment, as in the boss to the subordinate, right, calling in to check, right, or 
uh, dictating that things be done a certain way, right? Or uh, it could be done at an institutional, organizational level by having uh, bureaucracy and uh, and policies that are a bit kind of redundant to the cap uh, to the cap capability of today's uh, 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 employees. Okay, and then you know if left unchecked, ultimately this may make its way into Zone Six. Uh, and this would be where the parties kind of decide to go their separate way. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. aptly is named separation, and uh, sometimes it's a good thing, right? Meaning that the two the two sides just discover that uh, the values and their purpose just you know they don't align, and uh, there's no way to reconcile that. So they can they better separately going separate way doing different things, right? But I think more often than not, you also have. Um, Things that happen because of misunderstanding or lack of communication, and uh, people migrate into the zone because they had no nowhere else to go, right? So you can only push the person so far, and then they'll make a certain decision that may both may come to regret later. Right? So as you can see here, it's a framework that, at least uh, visually, it gives you uh, some something that you can work with, right? So if you're managing James, you're managing Lisa, right, or you're managing uh, you know, 10 other people, once you begin to see the relationship between freedom and this alignment of values and purpose, then at least you can have a map that you can work with in order to uh, at least have a conversation with the people on where you think they are, where they think they are, but ultimately to try to move people up the zone so that they go to zone three and then everybody can be, uh, you know, free to do productive uh, uh, things. So zone three is the sweet spot, is it not? Yes, for the manager is a sweet spot, right? That means that you can only have to say a few words and then, mm -hmm. then you essentially have a clone of yourself, right? Who are doing uh, something different. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Um, really like how you linked um, the practices in EPF to Robert Walters earlier on how the CEO mentioned them um, to design your own work and practices and policies in achieving the outcome. So that's very much um, aligned with how Robert Walters is doing it. Uh, with that, Mr. Monte, in, in the context of Robert Walters, given that the firm works at the forefront of executive placement, are you foreseeing changes in um, leadership and management requirements? And what do you think uh, Robert Walters and other organizations will be looking for uh, post COVID-19? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Dr. Hadija. So, I mean, if we look around, I mean, we are seeing business leaders uh, are really being pressed uh, to make drastic measures, uh, you know, realigning um, business directions um, based on the current climate. I mean, to put things into perspective, I mean, our clients and us, we had 24 hours to implement our BCP. And that really, and there were some companies out there who, who did not even have a BCP plan in place. So you imagine um, having to then shift as a role of a leader and manager, uh, you know, decision-making capabilities, testing leadership qualities, handling emotions. Um, are these new skills? Uh, not quite, but given the situation, we're definitely seeing these skills become more of a priority. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was actually, um, was it maybe a week ago, I was speaking to the CEO of a fintech business and, um, and he indicated that, you know, throughout all of this, it was a really good way for him to assess his uh, leadership team. Um, and that was from a resilience standpoint. So, you know, who has stood out and actually, to his surprise, it turned out it wasn't quite what he had anticipated. Um, you know, there were people in his leadership team and, and, and below the leadership team who had demonstrated flexibility and resilience. Um, so we're really starting to see these traits be um, uh, uh, what companies are, are looking at. So if you talk about hiring perspective, uh, personally, uh, you know, and, and based on what, what we're going to foresee coming up, but some additional requirements, um, you know, definitely experience in managing things uh, like remote teams. Um, you know, again, using technology is something that we're all now heavily reliant on, um, given, you know, we've got social distancing being something that I think is going to be a long-term effect. Uh, you know, we're seeing traditional businesses move into a digital platform. So definitely, um, you know, you, having that, technical savvy, not technical, but just being tech savvy. So business leaders who are tech savvy. Um, so again, being able to transform digitally, 
I was talking to somebody else again, actually, uh, earlier this week, and um, you know, and it got my attention because I was thinking, wow, you know, this person has has marketed themselves to be uh, very solution oriented, uh, senior level executive uh, who has a track record of, for example, driving transformational change, uh, organizational redevelopment within teams like HR. Uh, you know, things like, again, like as I mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, being flexible. So able to, to demonstrate uh, flexibility. And what I think is one, a, a, a definitely a skill that is going to be really something that needs to be tested is uh, empathetic leaders. Um, and uh, again, you know, there's, there's just so much uncertainty of what, what the shift is going to look like. But again, these are what we're seeing skills are being tested and, and we see, you know, companies wanting, uh, looking for leaders moving forward post COVID-19, these are what skills are, that are actually going to stand out. Thank you, Mr. Monte. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tan, if I may pose a similar question to you, um, are you foreseeing changes in leadership and management requirements and what organizations um, will be looking for post COVID-19? Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and you know, the irony of this is, you know, I mean, share a little bit about uh, the, the irony that I see in this is that, you know, uh, especially let's say we're talking about ASB or the, the higher learning or higher education or even corporate training for that matter, right? We're moving away from uh, physical beings together, right? And uh, Monty mentioned something like along the line of in addition to the digital savviness, right? We're also still looking for people who are good at human skills, right? And em empathy is one of them. Right, and, and empathy is actually is a skill. Empathy is not a trait. Okay, there's a you know empathy comes from you having the uh, the ability to read somebody else's feeling, right? And that is a trait. When I, uh, oh, sorry, that is a skill. Right? Because when I say that, I mean that when uh, when we were born up until about we were five six years old, we don't know how to have empathy, right? It is a skill that we learn by interacting with other people. That's when we begin to. Uh, to pick up those skills. And as you can see that in COVID-19, when, when we're moving away from that, right, even the classroom to learn about empathy cannot be in person, right? I'm not sure how, how do we learn how to be empathetical looking at a, at a small camera hole like I'm doing right now uh, on a computer, right, in order to work. So uh, it is a, indeed it's a challenge, right? And, and to come back to uh, managing by freedom within the framework, it's you know, it's, it's even beyond reading behaviors now. It's about understanding somebody else's uh, values and purpose, right? And then to link that to uh, as what we discussed earlier to the given freedom and trust to operate when, especially when we're working, uh, you know, from a distance, right? So but, uh, the reality of the matter is that with uh, technology advancement, with, uh, you know, people's ability to self-develop now, open source capability, sharing economy, et cetera, Right? We are now dealing with uh, employees who are more capable and driven than ever before. So I'm not, I'm not saying that managing by freedom within the framework, it's kind of like a silver bullet that's going to cure all challenges. It's not, right? But I think it's, it's, a, sim, you know, it's, a, it's a framework that it's, it gives us a way to look at how do we reinvent management right? when there may be no more business as usual. And uh, when employees now have the willingness and the skills to do the job, right, then what should the manager's focus be? Right? So I think this might be the new norm that we're looking at uh, when we come to uh, management and leadership. So in short, I, I, I think uh, you manage people better if, if you uh, can understand and make use of, of this lens, especially in the world uh, post-COVID. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Um, if I could summarize both of your um, um, sharing just now. So for time to come, um, this long-term impacts of COVID-19, we actually need uh, leaders and organizations who are more empathetic, tech-savvy, uh, flexible than ever. And also we need uh, employees who are very driven and more motivated and up as well capable um, to, to be um, tech-savvy. Um, Let's take a look at the Q&A slide now. Uh, may I please remind the audience that you could upvote the questions that you like by clicking the thumbs up button. For those who would like to give feedback or ask questions after the session has ended, please feel free to scan the QR code. Um, let's now take a look um, at the question on the top mm -hmm. of the list. 
So we have seven thumbs up for, the, for this question. Um, if I may read the question. Um, in times like this, how should business leaders demonstrate empathy for their people and customers? Many businesses are looking at pay cuts and other remuneration adjustments, which seem at odds uh, with this. Yeah, okay. I, I, I can jump, I can I can start with this one, uh, Dr. Hadija. So maybe I mean we talk about empathy here as as being, um, and as Dr. Tan quite rightly pointed out, as a, as a skill. And I think it is, it's it's not easy, but it's it actually just starts from listening. Personally, I'm just sharing, um, uh, you know, what my personal view on, on empathy is. Um, but really, actively listening um, to what is going on uh, to your people and to your team. Uh, and really just hearing them out. Now, we look around, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? You, you talk about pay cuts, you talk about, you know, uh, remuneration adjustments, people are being made to, you know, la being laid off, encouraged to take less hours, take less, mo less money. So I think communication and listening, you know, these are the two, two things that really need to happen hand in hand. I think if you're very open, have a very open communication and dialogue from the beginning to to your team, so that they know what is going on. It's it's very easy to think, oh, I think I think we should ring fence what's happening because we don't want to affect the morale of somebody in the team because it might have a negative impact. But actually, what you're doing is you're not communicating, you're not being open. So when when businesses need to make certain decisions, it comes as a blow. Um, so I think. When, what I'm trying to say is I think it's, it's really important to be to have a very open line of communication with your people and then actually just asking very straight simple questions like you know what is going on how are you how are you dealing with these times like this um, it's never a, it's never it's never a fun job to do for, as a leader to cut somebody's pay it, it's not something a business leader looks forward to at all um, and so I think I think you know when you show empathy, your team, your people will also empathize with you, and they will, you know, it, it just it becomes a two way, a two way, uh, a two way street. That's my two cents. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me let me let me jump on that because um, I, I I think you hit the nail right on the head, Monty. Which is, you know, it's that communication, right? And if I may even go one step further, right? That communication leads to honesty. Okay. So I think what COVID nineteen that we begin to see is that you know COVID nineteen is from a management point of view, it, it's a catalyst, right? That really show, it's, it's really showing how honest your organization has been managed up until this point. I think the conundrum of this question is, it's, it's kind of, to, it's trying to say that, can you be empathetical and also make tough decisions at the same time? And how do you get your people to understand that, right? And, and my answer is yes, I think you can be both. Right? It's not a choice between A or B. You can be both. You can be tough, you know, make a tough strategic decision, and you can also be empathetic. Right? And if I, if I may use a personal uh, um, uh, uh, example here, right? I, I used to work for BCG or Boston Consulting Group. Right? And we, had a, uh, we have a culture of this called up or out, meaning that either you get promoted uh, within the time frame, usually it's about 18 to 24 months, about a couple of years, uh, or you you have to look for a different job, right? That was the way uh, the business was run and is run, I believe, right? And uh, when I tell this to other people, usually a lot of people are shocked by this and they think that this is a cutthroat kind of environment and they don't, you know, treating their employees with respect. But the reality is that it works, right? Um, and the reason it works is because there's a clear understanding from the beginning, right? On, on, the, uh, on the values and purpose and on the culture that supports it. Right, so uh, let's say, for example, uh, when we're talking about out, right, or being outplaced, there's no stigma around it, right? It's not, there's no bad feeling around it, right? In fact, maybe 90% of the people who go through this path will be out at some point in the career at, at BCG, right? And, and, and we don't just kick them out on the street when the time comes, right? There are processes to help uh, you land proudly on your feet. So I, I think it's, a, it's possible to be both. And if you had been honest in your culture right, and, and living your culture and living your values and purpose, then it's perfectly fine to have an honest conversation that's both empathetical and strategic at the same time. I agree. Yep. 
Thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Mr. Monty. Um, if the audience uh, remembers when uh, we were registering for the uh, webinar, there is um, a, a box where you could ask your questions. So there is this one very uh, interesting question that uh, kept popping up. So um, the question goes, if schools remain closed for a more prolonged time post-COVID in view of children's safety, working parents will have to deal with a new reality of managing children at home whilst attending to their work. How should employers rethink work arrangements for such cases? If we could have Dr. Tan, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, yes. I'm dying to jump on this one. As you know, I have uh, two children myself. Uh, for me personally, even with managing by freedom within the framework, because you know it's usable even in personal lives. So um, COVID-19 in particular has given you know, my family a chance to create some framework, if you will, right, for our children to have the freedom in. So for example, we put in rotation for chores. Okay? So now kids every day, they're asking who's on uh, dishwashing duty for this meal today. Right? We have a rotating chore to do that. Right? We have contracts. Right? We're signing contracts for video games right? that you know, certain schoolwork needs to be done. Uh, before they can play games and there's certain duration that they can play it for and there's the caveats here and there, right? And, uh, and even daily routines that they're, they're now following uh, because they're staying at home so much, right? So, uh, you know, in, in, in the background, these are all values, if you will, right? These are all values that are we'd like the children to, have to learn. And it may not have been possible without COVID because their lives were not so... Uh, uh, systematic as they are right now, right? So we're just taking that opportunity to instill some of these values, right? So that they will have the, they, they'll know and understand the framework, right? So that they can have the freedom to operate within. So I think, um, you know, the, the questions on if the school remains closed for a long time, you think of it as an opportunity, right? To instill a similar framework and then to work out a system that your children, much like your team members or your, your, your subordinates, Right, who should be allowed a certain degree of freedom as long as they understood the framework that they're operating within. Monty, you want to yeah. jump in as well? <laughs> sure. So I, I don't have kids, uh, but actually maybe I'll, I'll share. I'll share. Um, so I've, one of one of my managers in, a, in in the leadership team um, is a working parent, uh, and that has had I've had to change my our leadership style because uh, you know it, it, it's it's quite reliant as well on her kids' schedule and. And we have to be flexible with with, with uh, such arrangements. Um, in fact, she plans her work around her kid's schedule. And you know, I sometimes her child will join us in our leadership calls and our meetings, and just embracing uh, this this working style and these arrangements. Um, it helps with the parent just to be okay that okay, uh, you know, the, the business understands that um, I've got more on my plate other than just uh, work. Um, so I think definitely from a flexibility perspective, uh, you know, again, being out, I mentioned earlier on just being outcome focused and just being aware that, okay, you know, we, we're very understanding and very aware of, you know, the, these, the, the time that you have to spend at home, you know, working through activities with your kids, totally okay. And honestly, it's not, not a problem uh, and it works quite well. Um, you know, of course, initially it was, it, there were, um, we didn't get, you know, at the beginning, it took a little while to get um, a routine set up uh, you know, and actually it was really interesting, you know, she's created a safe space for work and the child now knows that if, if mom's sitting there, it means she's in work mode, uh, and just coming up with just, you know, very creative ways to, so for example, if the child is doing an activity, that's the time, you know, certain, certain, uh, work I items can be addressed. So being, coming up with an agenda and a schedule, uh, that works for, for the child and for the parent, uh, that's works quite well. And, and for me as well, it's it opened up my, my eyes to a, a, a different way of, 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 of managing. So, yeah, so that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, we are mindful of the time. So we have five minutes left. If we could uh, discuss probably one or two more questions. Um, so the second most popular question here is, how do we assess our team's performance and well-being during MCO and post-MCO as well, um, as we will continue to work from home and social distancing measures are likely to be the new norms of the corporate world? Sure. Uh, uh, yes. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, Not a problem. Uh, yeah, no, so 
That, that's interesting. So when we look at, for, for us, um, performance measurement is essentially, you know, we're in line with what I mentioned earlier on about outcome, outcome focus. Uh, but I'd like to talk about well-being um, because, you know, we're again going into our seventh week and, uh, you know, it, while, whilst it was fine in the, in the first few weeks, uh, you know, the longer it goes, you think it becomes easier, but actually, it, you know, it becomes quite, quite challenging. Honestly, this is so important um, for us. So uh, we just try to have a ton of fun. We try and keep work light um, in terms of, you know, we, we have games um, and, you know, we, we, it, it is so critical. Some, sometimes people think, oh, well, that doesn't really make any sense or, you know, the, the time and energy it takes to, to put something a little bit um, outside of, 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 of what you're normally doing. It goes such a long way. Uh, so, you know, just, just making sure that everybody knows that it's okay to have a bit of fun in, in these kind of situations and environment. I mean, from a long-term perspective, we talk about social distance, distancing and, and this becoming a new norm. Um, I think it is taking, a, you know, it takes some adjustment to get used to this. Uh, but again, it, you know, the, the well-being, mental health and mental well-being is something, there, there are a lot of courses out there about well-being. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important to know how to keep yourself happy and how to keep yourself motivated. Um, but I think, again, just you know, putting some focus on well-being will actually result in your performance, your team's performance. I think that it goes hand in hand in hand, right? If, if, you, if you, you mentally stay, you, you're kept, right, right. You, you're kept, you know, if your well-being is maintained, then it's going to affect your performance. Uh, but yeah, have a bit of fun, you know, absolutely. Just, yeah. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be all about work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. I, I think uh, for the most part, right, organizations are doing quite well um, monitoring the what's the right word, the hard side of performance, right? The, the numbers being hit, you know, whether you can hit it is another story, but monitoring it, I think we've got the digitalization uh, element in part to help us with that, right? But I, I think Monty, and if I'm looking at another question here also relating to that, I think it's the, 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 the mind is around how do we make sure that the, our people, the, the softer side of our performance continues to uphold our, our motivation, right? Our uh, spirit is still high during the time that we don't get to see each other very much during COVID. And even I look down one question from uh, which the one you asked, Dr. Hadija, says, mm -hmm. how do you know if people are moving towards separation zone? <laughs> so I, I think this is kind of like what we were talking about here that uh, either the sense, the, the sense of well-being is going down, the motivation is going down, their spirit is actually taking a bit of a, uh, of a hit, right? And um, how, how do we move them off of it, right? So I'm going to actually take a crack at this, answer, at this question as in part to, to, to answer that question that you posed as well, Dr. Hadija. And, and I think to solve any problem, right, you have to be able to see it. Yeah, you have to be able to know what you're trying to solve before you can begin to solve it. And I think that's, that's why today when we talked about uh, the framework to use to manage the people with freedom, or it's, at least we attempt to make it as, uh, to be practical and useful. Because once you know where your people are, right, then, then you can have conversation that focuses on those behaviors. Because remember that you know, when we're talking about values and purpose of the organization, it's not about what you say, right? It's about what you do, right? And, and there are, there's, a, there's a huge step between what you say and whether you're doing the things you say, right? So organizations, CEOs may be saying that uh, our organization values teamwork and respect, right? Uh, but if you, get, if you get called out in public, right? Via email, via whatever, uh, for mistakes that were made, during this time that we are away from each other and, and may, may not have had a chance to vet it through it together. Right? But if you get called out in public, that, that is gonna send a different message completely from what uh, the, 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 you know, the preacher has, had, had preached. Right? So if you, left, if you leave these things unchecked, right, then it grows into resentment. Right? And then that's when people start moving towards separation. Okay, and, and I agree that there's sometimes there are good things, such as good separation, meaning two people are not meant to be together, right? But I think there are a lot of cases where this, it, it comes out of this resentment as well. And unless and until you're able to say that this is where I am, okay? And your manager said, oh, I thought you were here, right? And then once you can put your fingers down on something like that, even virtually, 
then you can begin to have a meaningful conversation uh, in order to sort out the issue. Maybe only something as simple as a, an apology, right, uh, of the inadvertent statement is enough to recover somebody from a situation of moving into separation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Monte, Dr. Tan. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Thank you, everybody, for posting your questions. Um, if I could remind everyone again, you could um, um, always send more questions or your feedback just by scanning the QR code. Um, again, um, very, very grateful to you, Mr. Monte and Dr. Tan, for being here and sharing your thoughts expertise and experience as well as enriching this uh, webinar series. Thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we can see each other again in the next round. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.